In order to help you progress yourself up into leadership, one of the big things I recommend is asking your manager, what is it that you need to see from me to be operating at the vice president level? If you're in a calibration meeting and you're talking about me um, being ready at a vice president level, what is it that you would see me doing that you would support me to be at a VP level? Hello and welcome. This is your host, Natalie Benamu, and every week, I bring you inspirational stories and insights to help you with the arc of your career and your personal life. I'm also the founder of her C-Suite, a network community of women where we are creating an ecosystem of limitless opportunities, hiring each other, promoting each other, referring each other, and more. I hope you will learn more at hercsuite.com. Today, I am thrilled to bring you my guest, Rachel Ernst. She is the CEO and founder of Excel Her Rate. And today we're going to be talking all about how you can leverage your career and your knowledge and be seen as a leader. Rachel has spent the last 20 years in HR leadership. She progresses women in leadership using her expertise. She was featured on Jane King's Innovators at the NASDAQ and is a published Forbes author, as well as a guest on multiple HR leadership podcasts. She is committed to working on the movement for gender equity across all leadership levels. I know you will learn so much about how you can change your visibility, leverage your connections, gain traction in your career, and more. So let's get started now. Rachel, I'm really excited to welcome you to Women Leaders on the Move today. Thanks for being on the show. Thanks for having me, Natalie. I'm really excited to talk to you, and I love what your organization stands for. Oh, thank you. And I'm so glad that we have synergy and that we found each other and and all the things, but our listeners may not know you yet. So I'd love to start with, tell us a little bit about the arc of your career and what's bringing us to this moment today. Yeah, absolutely. I have spent most of my career, about 18 years in the HR space, was very dedicated to helping raise the voice of employees to give input into the manner in which decisions are made and systems are created. So I've been in a lot of different HR functions, compensation, learning and development, people partnership, employee experience, all all these different pieces. While I spent time in HR, I found myself fairly gravitating also towards helping to build women, build women in leadership. Started that in college, helping to build a nonprofit for women and have just naturally gravitated towards that. So I have a passion for creating the right system for women to progress and also to one-on-one help women with what they need to do to really show their authentic power and grow. One of the things I've been hearing and I've become a little bit obsessed with, so I'd love your thought on this, is that there's this new idea. Well, it's not so new, but women are feeling, especially in the, the later part of their career, right? It's hard to stay relevant and be seen in that relevant position. What are you seeing in the work that you're doing for how women, especially the senior leaders, some of them are getting exited out and it's an unfortunate scenario that's happening. So I'd love to hear a little bit from you about how can we shift that first of all, and then how can we think about it differently in terms of organizational development and, and influence within an organization? When you say relevant, one of the things that I think about is what I help to coach women in is positive inquiry. So if there is, let's just say feedback and like, we need you to be more relevant. What I encourage is understanding what relevant means, relevant to what, and then thinking about what are, what is the unique value that I bring? Because I, you know, I think that there are a number of underlying natural strengths that women bring to the organization, regardless of their level, but especially women who have endured the challenges of rising in leadership, there is a resilience and I'm sure collaborative approach, because that's very natural for women that they naturally bring to the organization. So, you know, I think what I would recommend is kind of changing the question and, and understanding what is it that our organization needs? What does relevance mean? And what has made me successful in growing in the organization? What can I contribute based on that? 
to help the company be successful. So that's one piece. And what other piece that I would say too, is we hear the term AI thrown around in many different places. And there's this, there are a lot of statistics around women, quote unquote, adopting, however we want to define that AI versus men. So I, I do think that there is some importance in women staying abreast with that and understanding what AI is and adopting that on an ongoing basis. But again, in a way that feels natural to them versus what is defined as what, you know, what you have to do to be relevant. We just had a conversation about AI this morning, one of our masterminds, and it was about this specific topic. So it's, it's fresh on my, on my mind, but I feel like there's also for men too, but for women, especially there's certain segments in a company that are getting eliminated And it's not just relevancy, like, you know, staying abreast of AI, which everyone should know and understand and take courses. There's lots of free courses to learn basic prompts and things, you know, all the language that people refer to. But it's also about transferring your skills and making it seem like you, as a scientist, can also be a leader in finance because you have the acumen to understand how you need to stay on track and align things to the business. What have you seen in that regard that women can do especially well in terms of, hey, I I have been over here, but I really can transfer it over over to this place. I love that you brought that up. There is there is a huge shift called like a skills-based economy. I don't know if that term has come up yet in in your purview. And it's exactly what you're talking about is instead of looking at experience that people have had, it's more about what are the skills that I have that can be transferable in a number of different places. So I love that you brought that up. And I think it's kind of on women to help drive some of that too and support themselves and saying, here are the skills that that job requires. Or if that job description doesn't have that, like, let me, let me ask about what are the actual underlying skills that are needed to be successful. And let me share with you the skills that I have that align with that. So I'll actually give you an example of where this happened, where I was the culprit of saying, no, I need this experience and ended up bringing someone on board who had the right skills, but not the specific experience. So this person applied for a position that I was hiring for, did not have the specific experience that I was hoping for, but this person had the project management skills, the kind of communication skills that I was looking for. And I decided to give them a chance to interview with me and they ended up getting the job. But I think for women not being deterred by the the specific number of years of experience, because we tend to do that. And putting ourselves out there saying like, I have these and having people sponsor them or recruiters being partnering with them to help them find those jobs and get moved into those positions. But again, focusing on what are the skills that hiring manager you need in order for this person to be successful and let me show you what I've done to prove that I have those skills. I think that makes sense for anywhere that a woman is progressing in her career, whether you're mid-career and you're trying to make that leap and the the ceiling is a pretty hard stop for a lot of directors. Yeah. They're stuck at associate director and director and they're not making it to VP. And there's a couple of factors and I'm curious to hear what you think about this. Some of it is opportunity. There's only so many VPs. This is what companies will say often. Well, there's only so many vice president jobs available. And so we can't promote everybody, right? This is the, this is what you hear. But then the, the scales are not representative of the population that's working there. And then there's also to be a vice president, that leap from director to vice president is pretty big. And the demand on your time is 10x what people are expecting. I mean, yeah. it is, people are working weekends, they're working nights, that they're, they're expected to be on. That's part of the culture of that role in general, a lot of times. Yeah. So what do you what do you see to help bridge that gap and also to help women under, prepare? Because sometimes they think that, oh, I want that VP role or I want to get into that senior level. And especially the C-suite, it's even more demanding. And they're not ready for that extra like super demand on balance, like work-life balance? There are a few different things that that I've observed in my career 
around this. And this is actually why I'm so passionate about progressing women up into leadership, senior manager, director, and above, because it's exactly the issue that we see less and less women higher up in the organization, VPS, VP. So a few things I think about, and probably the first one is for women to understand what it is that is required at the VP level and not just the VP job description. I would say when Hey, manager or HR, when you talk about people who are ready to be a vice president, what is it that you see them doing? Or I would say, what do you need to see from me? How would how would I need to be operating differently in order to be operating at a VP level? What specifically do you want to see different from me? So the biggest thing is just understanding that. Now, I also hear a lot of women who don't even want to put themselves out there to be at that level because of the perceived demand on their time. Not even perceived. It's, it is a reality in a lot of senses. But one of the great things about women is that we're able to do a lot of different things. Just the way that our biology has evolved, right? Our, our, our vision is a lot more broad than men who tend to see more straightforward. And this is proven biology, not just something that I'm coming up with here. So because of that, I think when women are are even better about their boundaries, I've seen this, especially moms who have children, they are, they're more able to get a lot more done in a shorter period of time because that's what they're used to. So it, it sounds almost counterintuitive, but the ability to set very good boundaries around the times I am available or I'm not available, or this is when I can you can contact me. A shows strength and also B gives it a very compact amount of time. And then you're actually a lot more productive. So I think when women are very clear about their boundaries, and obviously there are things that you have to do, but when you're clear about that, I see women at all levels who are able to be successful, even at the top, while also being disciplined about their time with their family. And I'll give you one quick example. When I was at Fidelity, our head of HR was clear about every two days, <laughs> the two-day weekend is a vacation and that's the way I treat it. And she rose from being an admin all the way to a head of HR with that kind of philosophy. So it is possible. It's just being mindful about the boundary setting. Boundary setting is so powerful because I think it's easy to let things creep in, especially for the new in the last four years of hybrid work and of mix of being work from home or being in the office and the commute and all the things, what are some things that you're seeing that are helping to balance that part of it? Because there's just so many demands that are on our plate that we are juggling. And you're right. We can see, we can see the world and we're really good at like segmenting. I'm always like, okay, but I have five minutes. I'm going to make this one call for five minutes. Cause I know that if I could do this one call, I'll get that off my list. And and it's, you know, a personal call or whatever, but you're just like, okay, I'm going to call the bank five minutes and then like get back to business. So what are some things that you're seeing that are helping with that balance of trying to stay on track? Cause it's really easy to pulled in many directions. It is. It is. And similar just to relate to you, every minute is like, what's the best use of my time? How can I get the return on investment for every minute? I don't recommend doing that all the time, but that's what happens with me. When we were in COVID, we over time adopted to a way of life and, and that was needed in order to survive in this remote environment where the pending fear around getting sick was there. And luckily we've evolved a fair amount away from that. And so what I've seen is it it's taken time to evolve away from that way of working and companies don't typically recognize that the time it takes to evolve to this hybrid way of working, right? You can't just go back to work and suddenly have a new way of life. So I think recognizing that and giving yourself grace with that, it takes time to adjust the manner in which you have your family and the childcare options that you have and the time it takes to drop off the kids. Let's just assume you're in that position or their after care program. So just giving yourself grace to adjust to that new normal because that takes time. So I think taking a step back and recognizing what is the life that I want to lead and what are all the different factors that are impacting that and, and how can I adjust them in a way to get to that way of life that I they ultimately want to have in this new environment. So just that mindset and recognition is important. And then I think taking a look at 
where do I best use my, you know, when I'm in meetings, is it, do I, am I most productive in the morning, the afternoon, and just setting yourself up for success of when you want to have your meetings, when you need to have your think space, when your day can start, depending on your family obligations, and having a conversation with your manager about that. At my last company, we had what's called work agreements, and teams came together and talked about what is our on time, when can we be available, when is best to have our team meetings, In a global environment, which is very real global hybrid environment, what are the best meeting times across our entire company? And so I think having those conversations up front, kind of documenting them and having that work agreement, whether it's with your manager, it's with your team, it's with your function, it may sound tactical. And in some sense it it is, but it actually transfers into a broader strategy around having a good working life in this new hybrid world. It's so true because I think we're so used to now not realizing how long things, you know, can take and also being on all the time, like global, especially, you know, it is nice with the hybrid because at least you're working from home. If you have to take that 7 a.m. call for, you know, for Asia or vice versa, you know, people in other time zones, it it really makes a difference. But also I find when I go out and have a meeting, I'm not, I'm just so not conditioned. I, I used to be in sales. I did thousands of shows a year. I mean, trade shows was my life for my whole career. And now it's like, okay, yeah, I'm just going to get in the car. Oh no, I can't just get in the car. I have to like think about all this yes. stuff. You forget. I mean, it's so funny, but it's like, oh, I forgot that it's going to actually take me. Like, I always think, like, oh, five minutes. I think of everything in like five, 10, 15 minutes, right? Like, what's five? What's 10? What's 15? And it's never that. It's always like, okay, well, we have to think about like all these other things that are running through our minds. What do you tell people to kind of be able to focus on? Like, how do you, how do you make that shift to be ready to go back? And I know for a while now people have been going back in person, but it's still an evolution. So what are you suggesting for people to keep in mind? I know, I know it's, it's a practice. Let's, let's start with that. This is, it's not a, like, if I do this one thing and I think about it today and set this one goal, things will change. So there, there is an ongoing practice like time management, right? You have to think about what it is that you're trying to shift. So in this situation, it's, I'm trying to figure out how I can still get my job done while commuting, getting into the office and having calls around the world. So as, as fundamental as how long is it going to take me to get into the office? And that is the time during those times, I can't be in meetings. By the way, our company did not recommend taking calls from the road on your commute in. When we had our commutes in, that was your time to get to get in the office safely. And the days that you are not in the office are the times that you will have those, those international calls where you can roll out of bed, make sure you look presentable, and get on a 7 a.m., 7.30 call if needed. I think it's managing your time in a strategic way and kind of mapping out what is my week going to look like. And the reason I say it's a practice is it's almost like whether it's a Sunday night or Monday morning, wherever your energy is highest, is preparing your week. And you may not have needed to do that during COVID times or during the time when we work remote. But now I think it's more needed is setting aside time to plan your weeks and when you're going to have your calls and the planning your time for commutes and uh, and aligning that with when you have most energy. I do think that that's really important. Is am, I, am I a morning person? Am I an evening person? When do I when do I have the most energy to do the right things? But I do think it's it's back to planning my time and setting out my goals each week and how am I going to get that done and making space for yourself to do that. One of the things that I started doing is I just write the word block and I just block 30 minute increments on my calendar to give myself a buffer because I have a calendar. I have multiple calendars of people, you know, depending like podcast or I have, you know, meetings and people schedule in. And the last thing I want is to not have time in between if I'm just, you know, running up against it. Right. And like, just 
then there's no no time for me to just have that five minute five minute everyone can hear that that's my magic number but I need at least five minute increment or I can't I just can't think right so and I and I like what you're saying about picking the time that's best for you I, I'm a total really morning person like by the time late night I sometimes I think wow I don't even know if what I just wrote is making sense so because you're exhausted so how can women batch I like batching like batch yes. time what do you suggest for them to, you know, for all of us to think about? Yeah. Setting up think blocks. I'll be honest, like I would do this, you know, in the workspace and people still schedule over it. And so it's almost like I had to change the color of my calendar and make it red. And it's like, you almost, one of the tactics could be you're out of office. You're still working. You tell your manager that by the way, but, but you schedule yourself in in red block letters, do not schedule. DNS is a common term that I've seen, and that is your think block. And and I love the the point that you said. Just five minutes. You need space, and and there might be a perception that this think block or this space that you're giving yourself is a loss in productivity. But to be honest, from what I've seen, and you're shaking your head, it's almost like there is a two or three time return on that invested time because you're giving yourself the space to think. I think that's very undervalued. During COVID, there were a lot of mental wellness days or more space to think. And there is a perceived lack of need for that now because you know we don't have this impending sickness that's pending there for a lot of us. But I think this is really important and women need to do it and think about the time that they could do it. Block off four hours. It's not 20 minutes, by the way, you need a good amount of time. Even if it's like two to three hours, you need that space. So that's one, a time block, put it in red, put yourself out of office. And another thing is just some wellness time for yourself, five minutes, between meetings. I hear people, especially women, are less likely to go to the restroom than men and give themselves the space to do that. But it's important in putting that five minutes of time, don't run, give yourself some space. A lot of times I hear women, I just ran to the bathroom and back. Oh my gosh. You should like walk, give yourself a little space, let your time, let you have yourself the time, use the restroom, intentionally block that time on your calendar so that you're not that back to back to back to back. You need that time and it's back to planning your week and give yourself half an hour every week to plan your time. So you have your restroom breaks, you have your water, you have your food. Again, the people who do that are a lot more successful than people who are continuously driven by anxiety to get work done. Yeah, because the output that you're doing in that circumstance is just not your best if you're rushed all the time. You know, even if you're using AI and I use AI every day, even if you're using AI, it can't replace thought. You have to think about, I never... I never take something from AI and push it out. I always redo it. So you have to give your brain the time to like register. Yes. And and think about it. And there's a pause with that. I med- I do a lot of meditation. And so if sometimes I just need a break, it's 10 minutes and I just meditate and I'm, you know, and then I come back and I just feel so much better because it's just quieting that mind that, yes. that all the things around us that are just like demanding time from us. So my last question is, what are you most excited about? It's been my dream for a long time to focus on helping women progress in leadership, similar to to you. So I'm just really excited to finally be in this space to be able to do that. So I've given myself the space. No one's going to give it to you, by the way. Companies will always take. You have to give yourself the space. So I left the corporate world a few months ago. This has been my dream for eight years. So I'm really excited to just focus on helping women to progress in leadership in a more authentic way, not the way that has, that is prescribed to you, but it's looking at your natural strengths, your natural sources of power and channeling that in a way that feels innate to you to progress in leadership. So I'm just really excited about that. It lights me up every day. It makes my eyes shine in the words of Benjamin Zander, who's a conductor of an orchestra. So I'm just really excited to to have given myself the space to do that. Rachel, if people want to find out more about you and this exciting new venture that you're on, <laughs> where should they go to find you? 
Yeah, love it. Uh, my my company is called Excel Hurried with an H E R in the middle, so it's focused on accelerating women. I have a website www.excelhurried.org, or you can email me at rachel at accelerate dot com. Uh, you can find me on LinkedIn as well, Rachel Ernst. I'm happy to talk to people, and I really appreciate being a guest on your show. Thank you so much. It's been a really fun conversation. Very natural. Thank you so much for being here. I can't wait for our listeners to hear this. Thank you. Thank you for spending your time with us today. I hope if you found this episode helpful, you will visit us and rate and review on your favorite podcast platform or on YouTube, as well as share it with a friend or colleague today. This show is sponsored by Her C-Suite entrepreneur mastermind circle where we help entrepreneurs get started launch their business scale their business and more visit us at her c-suite.com membership to learn more keep shining your light bright the world needs you